Hi, Dolly. Hi. How are you doing? I'm good, Ari. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for inviting me. I mean, conversation needed to happen <laughs> at some point. <laughs> so I'm happy that we're doing this. Do so I'm just going to jump into it because we've yeah. had conversations for the last couple of weeks and I've been grappling with this idea. Right. This is the sad industry. Uh, this smokescreen of glitz and glam. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's almost like there are a lot of access points that you don't really understand or you wouldn't even think to to get to unless you're truly in the industry. Uh, and there's also this facade that all of it is so easy going, yeah. right? That it's just a case of getting in there. I can be a dealer today. I can be a gallerist today and I can sell works and make money. But it's not that easy. And considering we're in a developing country, yeah. right? Um, and we're dealing with the luxury industry. It's it's not all all glitter. So I'm trying to kind of speak to the gatekeepers of the industry. <laughs> I joke. Not the, I speak to I'm not the gatekeeper. Who are, people who are actually doing <laughs> the business and living and and kind of succeeding at it as well. Trying to find out how you do it. Um, but more importantly, how best you navigate this very multifaceted market. Yeah. Um, so I want to start off by going to who is dolly right <laughs> go back to your beginning days give me a picture of where you come from and more importantly when you look at the significant prints of your characteristics right um from when you were younger what has stayed with you up until this point big question for me big question <laughs> early morning big questions um well i <sighs> I mean, who is Dolly? I mean, I, that's I don't know. Maybe I should have interrogated that question quite a, quite a long time ago. I'm just a 29 year old kid. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a 29 year old gallerist, um, but Nigerian, looking for to how to define her dreams, and I found that in the arts. But I didn't always find that in the arts. So going back, um, was born in London. Moved back when I was a toddler, um, baby. Um, went to French school okay. my whole life. Um, so I went to the French school in Lagos, then I moved to Abuja at age six and went to the French school there. The French school in Abuja was the first Nigerian to attend that school. Um, so it's a school of mainly for the French expatriate community and the, and, um, the Francophone community in Nigeria. Um, and I grew up in a French world, um, living in Nigeria, but in a French bubble. So I actually had no Nigerian friends um, until, until I went to uni, funny enough. Um, no, until I went to boarding school in for sixth form. Um, I made one Nigerian friend that was in my boarding school. But from age four to 16, uh, I was in French school in Nigeria. Then I went to boarding school in France at 14. Um, and, um, then switched to the English system for my levels because I wanted to study in an English university and I'd never written an essay in English before. Um, and I never, I didn't know what it, I didn't know if I had the academic capacity to, to study or be educated in English. And I thought that if I was, if I wanted to go to an English university, I need to have at least two years where, um, you know, my academic learning is in my mother tongue, so to speak. Even though French to me was really my mother tongue because that's that's a language that I grew up conversing with my friends, but also being educated in. Mm -hmm. um, so I went to boarding school in England, an all girls boarding school uh, for sixth form after leaving France. And then went to uni in London, well, a year in the US in Boston in a liberal arts college called Brandeis, which I loved. And then um, tra transferred to London, to King's College London, to study political science, religion, and society. So sociology, theology, and political science, essentially. So wait, let's, let's unpack that, because that was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for a better part of your formative years, you didn't speak English, or at least it wasn't your first language. Well, I spoke English at home, but um, 
but that's because that's the language I spoke with my with my mom in because my mom didn't speak French. Mm-hmm. But I, I spoke French with my teachers and I spoke French with my friends. Mm-hmm. And all of my friends were French speaking because from age four, literally from um, kindergarten all the way to high school, um, I was in the French system. I was, in, I was educated in French and all my friends and all the people that were there were either Francophone or French. Um, then went to France. So yeah, that's all I knew. Wow. So I guess in navigating the world <laughs> <laughs> from a... You're Nigerian, firstly, with a Francophone kind of understanding of the world. How did that shape kind of how you stepped into going into university, right? How did that shape your learning experience? And I guess being bilingual, it was easy for you to kind of go through systems much easier than someone who, like myself, went. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> like how was how was that for you? I, I, I'm multilingual actually, not just bilingual. I speak I speak German as well, and um, are there some others? But um, but but regarding navigating the world, uh, it was not as easy as you think. Actually, the transition was very difficult because it was abrupt um, at 16 to suddenly switch to a, its entire new educational system that. Very, very different from the French system. Um, even just the culture of academia is, is is a lot more intense and but focused, whereas the French system is a lot broader. And of course, culturally, um, it was a bit of a, of a difference. Not a shock per se, because I was always familiar with England because my older sister, I have two older sisters, and they both were in boarding school in England from age seven and 11. So um, I would go to England for Exiat or for holidays. I had a family home there, so um, and uh, but it just it was different socially, and um, it was a tough. It was a very tough, tough, tough um, switch in 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 sixth form first, and then in uni, it's easier, right? Because in, in uni, you have people from all over the world that are there, and the good thing is, my first year of uni in, at Kings, I had um, uh, flatmates that were. French mainly, <laughs> so it was very, so it was, so it was very nice. Um, and um, but then I wanted to use uni as an opportunity to meet more Nigerian, mm-hmm. more Nigerian. So I joined African Caribbean Society. Don't we all? Do I, that? Don't, don't, we, don't we all? <laughs> and um, and then I started spending more time going back home during holidays in Nigeria to to hang out with people in Abuja. Um, and I made lots of Nigerian friends, and now I'm as Nigerian as you can get. Do <laughs> um, <laughs> you speak any language Nigerian? No, I only understand Yoruba, but I don't speak very well, fortunately for me. But I'm learning uh, this year, getting a tutor. That's mm. Very important. You mentioned that um, you went to King's College um, to study political politics, science. society, okay. and religion. Now, that wasn't the first um degree that you had started with right yeah. the understanding was that you had started with the degree at first and then you kind of switched what was that well you mean at king's or you mean when i was in when in, the you US? in the u.s yes. so I, well, I was international relations but the, the thing is in the u.s you actually don't define your major until sophomore year mm-hmm. but i had picked a path that would have led to an international relations major mm-hmm. um and then I'd taken some anthropology classes and some social science classes that I enjoyed, which was a natural transition, I guess, when I went to England and went to King's and, and I was doing sociology, RPS, religion, politics and society. Um, and um, I really enjoyed it. It was, it, was a, it was a very, very, very broad um, subject that touched on all the issues that I deal with and grapple with today and that I love, uh, religion, life and how and why human beings behave the way they do, and political dynamics, both domestically and internationally. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, that this very rich background to help to feed into the arts um, eventually, because you find all of those subject matters in arts as well. Yeah, so yeah, I mean for sure. But I mean, person that would say <laughs> <laughs> you don't have a formal education in the arts, and it's an it's argument people would have. You know, mm-hmm. in fact, funny enough, I had an, an argument with someone that said that. Artists, curators, gallerists that don't have 
a formal education in the arts oftentimes have a more successful art career or art business. Do you do you think that's true, or is it an argument that can? I think it can be made both both ways for sure. I th I think I think that it depends on what your path um, in the arts, what your aim is. If it's business, then you don't need a formal education per se, but you do need to catch up as much as possible by learning not just best trade practices, but art history and and contemporary art and read quite a bit. I think that. Um, not having a formal education in the arts does not exempt you from doing the work and the homework and the study. And I, and I, I personally believe that um, higher education is really just a platform to begin, you know, a lifelong process of education, research and study. And I think I've done a lot more reading <clears throat> post-university than even during university. So um, it's not to say that not having a formal education means not being educated mm -hmm. in the arts. It's just two different things. Um, and I think that um, ideally it should be it should be necessary. But yeah, I mean, um, not not necessary. It should it should be done in one way or the other. But um, I think it depends. I think that having a business mind that maybe is not art focused can maybe help broaden your horizon and the way you navigate the world when you eventually do enter the arts. I think that it's benefited me in some way um, because I didn't enter the arts from an academic perspective, I entered it from a business angle mm -hmm. and I looked at it and then was able to find my pathway as as a result. So I mean I agree, even if I did study art history. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that <laughs> argument really falls in a different aspect to me. <laughs> but um I entered the industry with both a business mindset, but also just in an in an effort to expand in the best way possible, yeah. the industry is on ground. Um, so let's talk about this industry that we have, right? Um, we are in a developing country, and I said it before. <laughs> the beauty of that is that there's so much to develop, mm. right? Um, and as a continent, even, I guess, nationally, we are unfortunately trying so hard to catch up to this very fast evolving Western market. <laughs> yeah that is fully, fully, fully formalized and it's just ever changing and it's just flowing, right? And expanding not only to the West, but even to the East. Mm -hmm. this world, right? So how do you think as an industry, at least within Nigeria, how can we keep up? Should we keep up? Is it something that we should balance? What, what are your views? We must keep up or... <laughs> what, what, what else am I here? <laughs> no, 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 I agree. No, it's it, it, it's... It's a it's a very very daunting task because the Western market is so far ahead, and we are just beginning the stages of infrastructural development and putting in place the processes that are required to even have a coherent ecosystem um, to navigate our own industry and then to be able to compete internationally. But but then it, it happened to then also coincide with the moment in which contemporary African art, art from the continent just experiences massive spotlight mm -hmm. all of a sudden. You know, I think a lot of people in different branches of the ecosystem are feeling that. Mm -hmm. um, and if we didn't feel the need to compete before, I think there's certainly a mandate to do so now because it would be unfortunate if you had this boom. And I say that, I often say it's the golden age of, of, of African art, mm -hmm. um, sort of rise um, on the world stage with very little platforms, indigenous platforms following that rise. Mm -hmm. Because if you do that, then that means that the, the entire narrative is going to be shaped by a region that is not immersed um, in the source of, of the work that they're glorifying at the moment. So so there is sort of a call to action for gallerists and dealers and curators and educational practitioners and artists as well, and auction houses, I guess, to and nonprofit institutions to, um, to formalize their structures as quickly as possible, to um, participate in the conversation locally and internationally, 
and to find a way, despite the fact that, as you mentioned, we live in a developing economy, which means that the business in many ways is not sustainable. Um, if it is entirely anchored regionally, we do need the West and the East to be able to to, to thrive and succeed and to, to make sales and to prop up our artists and to promote our artists. Um, but we shouldn't do so without the understanding that we must also build those infrastructures at the same time. So I have as a mindset to wear multiple hats. Yes, I'm a business owner, but I'm also somebody that is an ecosystem builder. And so I try to look at where, where are the gaps and if the gaps are in policy development, if the gaps are in infrastructure development, if the gaps are just in conversation and dialoguing with other people in the ecosystem for us to even have a sense of awareness that there is such a thing and that we want to define what that looks like. I think that we have to have this conscientious role in sort of straddling all of these same spaces because unfortunately we don't have the luxury of just focusing in one angle yeah. and saying that I just want to run my business because we're not islands, you know? Yeah. So it's a tough one. But I guess as in our own little, I guess, microcosm, we have to start off as islands before we become this big yeah. landscape. <laughs> um, because, I mean, you if we look at just simply funding, right, it's as an individual, it's already very daunting mm. to, to try and fund one little project. Mm. Um, you also have different people trying to, to you know, attach themselves to different parts of the industry and establish themselves um, as sole islands in some things. For example, you're someone that's looking at the Francophone and Anglophone parts of this nation, mm. or at least this this continent, mm. and bringing those factors together. Mm. We're looking at more uh, contemporary artists, but then um, mid-career to established, mm. um, and those that have oftentimes been forgotten. Mm. And then you have people that are trying to shadow different parts of the industry how are we all meant to bring it together um yeah, yeah. i mean what do you think about well it's a puzzle isn't it i mean the, the, the bigger picture you need different pieces to make the whole mm -hmm. so um all of those things to me just speak to diversity and that's a good thing i mean if you didn't have all of these differences then the industry would be monotonous which would be, which would be boring sure. because the good thing is that art is subjective and it's to be acquired and experienced by people of different backgrounds and experiences and different collectors like different things mm -hmm. and so in fact i would even say that that creates an, an even wider incentive for us to collaborate because if we were all focusing on the same thing then we'd probably be competing all the time for the exact same collectors because we'd also be working with the exact same artists mm -hmm. who focus in the exact same way yeah, uh, I mean, that's kind of already and that's kind of already happening so... <laughs> i'm sure but my point is that there's a big world out there yeah um and with the conscious knowledge that, look, none of us can really hack this thing by just focusing on Nigeria and Lagos yeah. and fighting over the same resources. Mm -hmm. When you have a big, big wide world out there, the, 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 the onus is on us is for us to think strategically. And yes, you do start off as an island uh, because you do have to have, you know, your own business and your own profile and your own ambition and you're an individual. But it's in the same, I think about it in the same way that the individual is the individual, but the individual is also part of society and a community. And so does not, they're not mutually exclusive things. I think that you can find a way to prioritize yourself and what you're trying to do while also prioritizing in other ways, the wider community. And it can be for yourself, right? Because you, if you understand that the ecosystem, if the ecosystem thrives, it is beneficial to you. So I'm, it's not a call to altruism here. It's a call to self um acknowledgement and self i don't know benefit at the same time while also looking at how you can work with other people at the same time so i i i feel that um that there's a lot to do and i think that it's just hard when you're building something and it's so difficult and you can't really see the end of the tunnel and it just seems like the mountain is so huge and um, it's not as glamorous as a lot of people think. I'm sure people who are not in the art world think, ah, these arts people are just enjoying. Mm, just so just drink, drinking wine and then <laughs> are hanging, are hanging, hanging out on the wall <laughs> and going to parties and events. But um, that's actually the sad part is that a lot of people don't understand the back end of the art, of yeah. the art world. Um, so I think even speaking to that, before we get to that, let's talk about you, how you got into it. Ah. Right. <laughs> 
Russia Africa is your gallery, right? You started that at 21. Um, but pre that time, actually, you had been, you know, in the ground rules of the industry, at some, so to speak. How did that begin? Yeah. Um, walk us through that, that part quite briefly. Um, yeah. um, I've said this a few times. I think, um, I think, yeah, I think I will add no intention of going into the art world, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, um, what did you want to be? I wanted to be in public office, you know, and I wanted to work in policy development. So I had as a goal to get a job off the bat of also uni at some international organization, which I did actually. I worked at UN Women for six months. Okay. Um, but um, so I eventually, and then find a way to, to get to get into Nigerian public policy was was my ambition, my goal. Um, and the last year of uni, a friend of mine um, had floated this idea of a online art platform that he wanted to build, which was just to sell art online and wanted a co-founder investor to come in. Okay. And he said, the name of this platform will be called Retro Africa, right? Now, around the same time, Bissy Silva was appointed as the consultant and curator um, with Tukini, uh, for Tokini Pizza Side's first edition of Art X Lagos. And this was in what, 2017? Uh, yeah. Actually, much earlier. I think it was 16, 16 yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, it was 2016, I think. Yeah, pretty sure. And um, Bissy was the curator. She also knew a lot of people in the ecosystem, in the art world, and um, a lot of gallery owners um, uh, knew her. And um, she, I think pulled together a lot of her network for the first edition. And um, one of those participants was a Francophone gallery called Gallery Medina, mm -hmm. based in Mali. Uh, with his found the founder is called Ego. And Bissi was like, look, Dolly, please, I really need somebody to assist me because I'm very overwhelmed and it's quite busy. And I have this friend of mine who's francophone and i just need you to take him off my hands <laughs> i need somebody that can speak french that can check him to his hotel that can be his gallery assistant for the, for the first fair we don't know what it's going to look like we don't know what, how it's going to go um and he a lot of people come to nigeria for the first time um i just need you as a french speaker and if there's any other french gallery or any french person that's available i'm going to just put them with you and please can you just help and i say yeah sure you know I'm graduating soon, um, uh, but I'm on holiday around that period. I can come to Nigeria. I used to use any opportunity I could then to, to just travel to Nigeria. Mm. If it was just for one month, I was like, or one week or other. So I was like, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll help out. So I came to Nigeria and I, um, I loved it. You know, it was a really wonderful experience. I, 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 I was uh, Gali Medina's assistant during that first edition, I met a lot of people. I saw pictures from that first edition, actually, of me and Victor, me and other people, I think. Um, and um, it was a very, very enjoyable experience. I suddenly discovered a whole world of art. Now, around the same time, when I was at King's, there was, I believe, 154 that took place at Somerset House, which is adjacent to my yes. campus. And I also then discovered, you know, contemporary African art mm -hmm. um, in London as well. And I thought this is really interesting. This is not what I expected African art to be. Like anybody else, anybody that doesn't know anything about art, who thinks, what is that? And then they see, yeah. discover this amazing... Uh, that was what, the second third edition? Of, what year was of 154? Yeah. I don't remember what edition it was, but I do know that it was, in my mind, I, I know those two simultaneous experiences of Art X and 154 and discovering them was this aha light bulb mm. moment in my mind in which it redefined what I understood to be African art and also the depth um, 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 of, subject, of the subject matters that the artists were exploring. Mm -hmm. And as, my, as a result of me working with Ego, I was able to utilize my skills. I was speaking French. I spoke German to people though, that I met that could speak German. I um, was talking about polit political science and the world and ideas and um, and I was discovering a lot about art history and about contemporary African art generally. 
And I was like, this is what I want to do. Yeah. So I went to my friend and I said, sure, I'd be happy to, I'll be happy to co-found this project with you. But I don't think that an art online platform is going to work. I think that nobody's going to buy art from people and they don't know their face. Yeah. They don't know the, the, na- the platform behind this project. I think we need to start curating shows and we don't have a gallery, but we can start doing pop-up projects. So I decided to spend the next year hopping around the world with Ego. Um, he invited me to do Documenta 14. He was invited as a guest curator for the um, for specific exhibition at Documenta and they were trying to get more African involvement. And he said, would you like to be my assistant curator for that project? So I went to, and that year I was in two cities. It was in Greece and it was, it was, in, it was in Greece, Athens, and it was in Castle, Germany, as it normally is every five years. Mm-hmm. And I got thrust again into a whole world of international art curation where I met Emeka Ogbo, I met Otto Bongo Konga, I met all sorts of greats that were participating for the first time, um, funded by then Sindika Dukolo, the late Sindika Dukolo who was this great African collector. Um, and I uh, met Bonaventure, um, who um, was one of the curators of life art for Documenta 14. And I came back to Nigeria, started doing pop-ups in Abuja. Long story. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I mean, first and foremost, it's crazy because I think I mentioned this before that starting off as someone who worked alongside Missy Silver, God rest her soul, I never actually got to meet her, but she had so much influence very early on, at least the start of the contemporary art, um, African art industry, where things were, when new artists were popping up, they needed some sort of direction. She was kind of the soundboard for most of those artists and most curators that were starting out as well. And it's so fortunate that you happened to be one of those individuals, but Mm. it just seemed as if your career went from step to step and it was almost (laughs) godsend. I mean, (laughs) I was looking for a way. I just had a way. I just knew. But it was almost godsend that you got to that point. It's it's so interesting. Actually, that was your, that was your trajectory. Um, And so for, for what, for the first, when did you open uh, Retro Africa? Um, And why actually, why Abuja? (laughs) So we always say that Retro Africa was founded in 2015, but what I mean by that is that the platform existed, right? Uh, because the idea for the platform began around that time with um, um, the the platform that Abdul um, was my friend at the time and partner, uh, um, and I had conceived of, and then the rest just began to unfold in the, in the following year. Yeah, Abuja, because Abuja is where I grew up, um, is where my family was based. Um, was where my house was based. Yes, I have a house here in Lagos. Um, and um, the art world is concentrated in Lagos. But when I didn't know much of what I was doing and I wanted to do pop-up exhibitions, I needed a safe space. <laughs> I needed a place to do things on my own terms, in my own way, and make mistakes and, and, and learn along the way. And um, I couldn't just come to Lagos and be doing pop-up exhibitions in the pre-existing ecosystem because there were already people and players, um, not that many. The player, the primary players then were um, Signature Gallery, I believe, and there was Thought Pyramid, I think, already then. And you had, sorry, you had Art 21 already and you had Bloom Art. Um, and, well, and well, well, she was in the gallery at that point. Um, uh, well, what Co is now? It was, was you had uh, you had Art House uh, Contemporary, uh, like the auction house. So and of course you had TCA. Yeah. I believe those, those were sort of the main players at the time, and then of course Art um, Art X um, was emerging around then. So I just I just felt that, and then you had AAF, of course. Um, I just felt that there wasn't room for me to navigate in something I didn't quite understand, and I hadn't yet had a proof of concept. So the, the easiest way is just to start small, mm-hmm. and I did start small. We we did we did exhibitions at what was known as the Exhibition Pavilion, which is this actually purpose built exhibition space in Abuja mm-hmm. that nobody ever used. And so we just went and rented the space, and we we would have exhibitions there. And in hindsight, the exhibitions there were quite grand. I, I mean, I, I mean, for like the first time, we yeah. did you know we did a lot of projects with like a lot of familiar names. Now we did a group show with Tony Energy. We could. Um, um, we had, um, it's called Afromodernism. We had a, sh- a show called Generation Y that had a lot of artists that 
I work with now, Ken Nodiogu, Tina Deboale, Ame Ame. I don't work with him. He works with really now, but we given him, I think, his first exhibition, then that group show. Um, William, I think William, I already mentioned Williams. There were lots of artists um, that were, Ayo uh, Aki One Day was also in that show. Um, lots of really emerging artists mm. at the time for that Generation Y show. And then the Afro-Modernism show had um, Uche Okwai Roha, Duka Sidere, um, and I don't know how, we just happened to, and Rom as well. Oh, wow. um, we, we just happened to get some people who believed in us. Like, I remember we went to some of these artists and they said, oh, you guys are young, 21 year olds. Like, I mean, <laughs> and they were like, it's crazy. And that, <laughs> but you really had this, and considering you didn't even, you weren't, again, you didn't have an educational background in the arts. You had experience to some degree, but all these other artists who had been either emerging or the ones that had really been going to the inner workings of the industry just believed in your vision. You believed that everything was okay. I don't know if they Enough believed in my vision. Or if you ask them, I don't, I don't think that it was a vision be, believing thing. I think it was just, uh, yeah, I mean, I would, I would credit a lot of the, even those artists, not the Generation Y one, we did, a, we did an open call on everybody that participates in Generation Y was a young artist that, that applied. But for the Afro-modernism one that had a lot of big artists at the time, I'll actually credit it to Mr. Uche Jochima and Duke, who were the two who believed in our vision and who called, made lots of calls on our behalf. And to be honest, they didn't know us from Adamo. They didn't know us from, they didn't know us from anywhere. They just said, I like your, I like your energy. I like your mm. spirits. Let's do let's do something, and then he, they made lots of calls. We did a list of artists, and they, and then when we'd go to the artists, they'll say, "Okay, well, Mr. Du called, Mr. Uche called me, and said that you guys are, are good people, so we'll give you some work," you know. And uh, we're like, oh, "Thank you," <laughs> and we wow. did the show. Yeah, and then we—I we, love Mr. Du for that. I love him. Because you know, he's, a, he's an advocate. Yes. Anybody that he believes in, even if he doesn't, yeah. but he knows that there's energy or this passion behind it, yeah. he will always get behind you. Yeah. And even if probably you end up being a bad person, he just says, I at least I put some sort of bearing down or I said I will advocate for you mm. so that you can at least have a hand in it. Because again, there's no the access points that we oftentimes overlook. Yeah. You forget that a lot of people have to advocate for you. Yeah. Business. I agree. Um I like the idea of they're now being having been an eight year period from when you really officially started in the industry up until now, right? Um, it was vibes. It was vibes, <laughs> <laughs> but I know now that's not the case. <laughs> but I, go say, yeah, I hope it's not the case. Um, and I know that you had a partner that you worked with. Um, at what point did you part ways? And I guess whenever I think of uh, businesses that have uh, co founders, it's a lot of one person doing one part of the business and the other doing another and somebody being the person that you interface, the other person being the back end of the business. Yeah. Who are you? If you were the one at it work, rather, who are you and where did you find your bearings once things happened? Like, yeah. You're always asking me who I am. Yeah. <laughs> because I need to know who you are in the context of the business. Right? Um, yeah, so I was the front facing. So I was the ideas building person. Okay. Um, and we did work quite well together for the first couple of years, which is, you know, I'd go out there and meet a lot of international people and art industry stakeholders, and I'd come back with the knowledge that I acquired and we try to apply them um, in our own little context. Um, and um, he was a very, very efficient operations person um, that did a lot of the business structure of, of the behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it worked really well for the for the period of time that, that that, that it was working. But as you said, the gallery has evolved a lot since the vibe spirit. It's evolved into a, an international structure and business. And um, I think that maybe we were friends, but where we decided to part ways was in vision for where the gallery could go. And it's very hard to imagine a future that you've never built, right? Mm -hmm. and, it's, and, and, and don't forget that around that time, nobody was, almost nobody was doing international projects mm -hmm. um, then even, the domestic galleries um, were doing international fairs. I, I think maybe um, R21 had done a couple of 154s before. Um, and, and maybe AEF. Yeah. 
Um, and maybe somebody had done a Joburg at some point or something. But it wasn't like a consistent thing where Nigerian galleries were showing up and participating. Uh, because one, contemporary African art wasn't as big in, internationally then, in, I mean, in the way that it is now, anyways. So um, it, it was a question of, okay, where is this going? And I think that when we made the decision that this is going to go as a full term time business, don't forget we were 21 years old. Mm -hmm. And so when I say three years in, we were only 24, <laughs> trying to figure out who do we want to be for the rest of our lives? And I think that I had the very clear vision that I wanted to be a creative entrepreneur. I use that word very carefully because it 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 it, it goes outside of just what you see right now. But um, and I think that he wasn't sure. And I think that there were some clashes in terms of, you know, direction and 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 I also was putting in a lot of capital injection into the project and I was curating. So I think that eventually we decided to just part ways because um, he also was doing other businesses as well. Um, and um, there was just a vision difference. And so we, 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 we parted ways eventually. Um, as I said, we were friends. Um, and we're still very friendly. We're friendly. Um, and um, I decided then that I'm going to take Retro Africa seriously as a long-term business. Um, at that point, we had... Um, opened, we had opened our, our first physical gallery in Abuja, the brick and mortar. So 20, in 2019, um, and yeah, then the, the, the long run, the long road began. We had already started art fairs before we opened the gallery. Though. Actually, I knew this. I knew that you, you had. But I mean, that split must have been very difficult for you because it means that now you're, in fact, it's so funny because you weren't even the one that brought the idea of Retro Africa to fruition. So how hard was that for you? Well, I think, I think well, what I would say is that the idea that uh, we first joined, we first came together on was, was a very different idea than what I then eventually proposed, right? What, what, what I, the idea that I initially invested in, right? So you had an idea. Um, that hadn't yet been executed, but the idea was an online platform, which I put in investment in. But that idea for me wasn't viable. And I think now that I know what the art world, I knew it wasn't viable. Yeah. So um, the curatorial part from the very beginning was my initiative and my work that I had done in my relationships. So it was easy for me to continue that part because that's what... I had had a very clear vision of what I wanted to do mm -hmm. and where it was going to go. And so the split was hard in the sense that it's always hard when you're parting ways, um, when you've started something together. But in the end, I think it was the best thing for the two of us anyways, because Retro ended up sort of launching and catapulting um, um, quite significantly thereafter. And I think it's also hard when you're putting in a lot of the curatorial work, um, you know, in conjunction with your partner, of course, but you're also putting in most of the finances. And and I think that after a while, they're, 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 they, 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 the strings emerge and um, it's always best to part ways when you have clash and vision early yeah. before it's too late you, you know and before you start before you start yeah. yeah before you start to scale and the different stages of scaling i'm trying to enter a new stage of scaling Correct. now yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay so let's talk about retro africa hey. right <laughs> let's do it in a very quick I situation <laughs> because i mean you've had a lot of milestones um and granted everybody knows the the um I guess the face value of what Retro Africa is. But let's talk about the inner workings of the business, right? <laughs> gallery running is not easy. I would tell you that for free. I mean, oh. I, I manage Udo Art Gallery at the moment and you're wearing several hats, as I mentioned before. You're not only the manager of the entire gallery, you are the client liaison, you are the sales person, mm -hmm. you are the uh, HR manager, you are also dealing with scaling the business, you're programming, you're curating, you're doing all these different things. And, you know, for me, at least, I'm not the director of the company. I 
in it. But for you, that's a different mindset. How do you cope? <laughs> Tell me that you're traveling from left to right. <laughs> and you also have to find a way to have some sort of life work balance. And we know that's not a thing. What are you? How are you navigating that situation? Most good thing, Jesus name. Amen. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, no, it's hard. Yeah, that's why. That's why I said that. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people don't understand the inner workings of a, of a gallery. They assume it's 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 easy work. That it's really just you bring art, you hang it, and people come, they buy. Right? They don't they don't understand that that's just the presentation side. Yeah. The, the most of the work is operational. Uh, public relations, client relations, stra strategy, curatorial, academic research, writing, and um, yeah, just entrepreneur, general entrepreneurship in, in any business. And with the added benefit that you're actually managing artists, yeah. right? And so I think a lot of people forget that part. They think um, that you're, you're managing artists' career. So I, I usually try to give them the example of, okay, I think you understand what it means to be uh, a manager for a musician. I right? usually use that same. I use the exact same. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do when you manage a musician um, that is maybe an emerging musician or an established form? You you can think of probably off the top of your head the things that you do. You, you, you're you managing their marketing. You're managing their, the release of their next album. You're helping them prepare for their next album. You are doing their PR. You are um, cutting deals for them, you know? Um, and you are also on your own end, your own end, doing the business side of it, including the finance, the, the legal work, the etc. Right? The same thing for a gallerist, but that's just the manage artist management side that we do for the artist. Mm -hmm. So we 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 brand, we do image branding, marketing, PR, we sell their work. So the album in this case is the artist's work. We help them prepare for their work, the next direction. Where are they going? We try to get them into the right. Um, residencies, the right projects, we curate their shows, while also running the business, right? Because the business itself is a platform that legitimizes the artist. And so the business itself also need, or needs all of those things. The business needs PR, the business needs marketing, the business needs clients, the business needs operations, needs admin, needs a legal framework, the business needs to get into certain fairs and needs to apply to certain fairs and needs to spend money on certain fairs and needs to spend money on its own, on, on itself. And um, and that's before you even put on a show. We've well, not even gotten to putting on the show. And the process of putting on the show from the research, from the logistics, from the, the costs, from the branding, from the preparation, from the writing of the art books, which is which is in 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 of itself research and 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 work um, to curation um, to trying to sell the show right um, and then of course you're doing multiple shows every year and you're doing fairs so it's not just what you see in the gallery um, you may see a work in the gallery and that's what's or the only thing that's happening you're also trying to sell your other artists outside of what is currently on display so you're doing all of these things are happening simultaneously and of course international projects that you're also doing with clients and you're also trying to think of what next mm -hmm. what other opportunity can i present because you want to keep scaling because your gallery is only as relevant as the projects that you do and the places that you go and the doors that open for you so you still have to do general business strategy and so outside of the projects that you're doing as an individual you also have to travel a lot you know you're traveling for the work and for the project but you also have to travel a lot to make friends in the industry right to 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 make connections in the industry to get opportunities for people to give you those opportunities or offer you a collaborative opportunity or for you to meet someone in the industry for your artist that can maybe benefit your artist if you want him to be acquired by a museum one day you know and so networking is a huge part of the job like i say that's 60 70 percent of the job um while doing all of the other things in the gallery and running it and that costs a lot of money. <laughs> it's not, I promise you running a gallery is not just come to my exhibition and I've hung this painting and I called somebody to come a hammer on the wall well, you know, and you came on board. Need, that's exactly what it is. In fact, some galleries just do that yeah, and sustain themselves. In fact, it's more, more so for the vibes, <laughs> you yeah. know? I, I mean, this is the reason why a lot of people are essentially breaking down, right? Mm. I don't know how... Some people, I mean, how big is your team? I think we are, we're seven in total. 
yeah. And individual marketing, people. marketing, Maya, gallery manager, uh, Jennifer, head of design, Alpha, admin, and accounting, uh, Marcel, logistics, Beatrice, uh, and then myself. Um, and then we have two people who are part of our team, but are not um, working with us permanently on projects. So I have Josh, mm -hmm. who was with me from back when, when I was still working with Abdul, also my friend, um, who's a director in the gallery. And then I have um, Igo Jara, who's not part of my gallery, but he has his own gallery in Mali, but is, we're, we're partners in that we, we, we liaise for potential opportunities. So sometimes we, we do projects together. Um, so I'll say the team itself is seven. And um, then if you add Eco as a partner, so to speak, like collaborator, then it's eight, but really it's, it's seven for the internal team. So, but, but for you, how many hats do you wear at least? How many jobs do you carry on your back? And I think my question really ultimately <laughs> is, what do you think you need to think to carry on or sustain at least where you are today. And at least in terms of the growth or where you expect to get to at the gallery, how do you think you can get there with what you need? So, so that's the tough part, right? It's because I, I think I laid out the trajectory of emerging of, of a gallery growing. Because I said as the artist grows, you're trying to, to increase an artist's price point. You're also trying to increase the value of your gallery and your brand, meaning that the more you do that, the more you have to spend. And so eventually you do have a lot of Expensive artists or mid artists or emerging artists that are quite expensive. It's a luxury item. Don't forget, um, you only buy art if you have disposable income. It's not in a, it's not a necessity in that you need to eat, you need to have a house over your head. It's something that you have as an extra, and you're doing that in a developing economy, right? In which majority of the population is under the poverty line, and then you have a smaller percentage of people who have wealth. So to scale. The only way you can scale is with capital injection. And it's very, very limited creative industry capital injection in Nigeria. And so I am a sole owner. I don't have any investors. But eventually, for my brand to keep growing, I have to open spaces abroad, right? I have to open spaces in New York. I have to open spaces in London. I have to open spaces because I need to have more collectors. I have to widen that pool. And yeah, so. Yeah, eventually what you need is to find financial structures in the ecosystem that can actually allow these businesses to grow beyond their existing capacity mm -hmm. because that's the trajectory. Unless you're content with sort of where you are and you're not, you don't really have an international focus, in which case it's also okay. So people have a domestic inward looking sort of vision, mm -hmm. but um, yeah. Oof, wow. Okay. Well, we don't have that much time, so I'm just going to... Shave it all the way to the end. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think uh, two questions. The first, what, what would you say is the highlight of your career? Um, and the second would be, actually, after that first, now I'll see the second. I don't think I reached the highlight of my career yet. So, but no, I mean, maybe the highlight of my career was uh, when we did our first Art Basel, okay. which was a couple of months ago. So we, we got into Art Basel Hong Kong for the first time. I think a lot of galleries who do fairs aspire to one day show there. And it, yeah, I think, yeah, I think Art Basel was, was definitely the, the, the highlight of my career. Um, um, I, that and just, I think all of the international projects that we've been doing lately, um, you know, maybe another highlight was two, three years ago, when we did our first collaboration with Lima Mopin Gallery in New York. So that was our first New York exhibition, Retro in New York. So we popped up um, and did a gallery takeover. We're doing a lot of those lately, but we did a gallery takeover of Lima Mopin um, in, on the 22nd Street space. And we featured Victor Ehekemeno, Shiri Samba, and um, Nate Lewis. An, an exhibition, a uh, two and a half month exhibition in the middle of Chelsea, it was wonderful. Um, and we, that was probably even more of a highlight than their Art Basel because that's what led to um, all the things that are happening, that, that have been happening since. Um, Lima Mopin is, is a top 
you know, blue chip gallery. And I just happened to somehow connect and make friends with its founder, David uh, Maupin. And he just took a shining to me for whatever reason, uh, which I'm grateful for. I always tell David that he's, he's, he's a wonderful mentor. And, um, and as a result of that project, I got a lot of, a lot of other opportunities um, that came my way. And um, now we're, we've been doing international projects left and right. We're doing Art Singapore in January um, with our artist Ken Wadiopu. We're doing another gallery collaboration in London next month with Ken Wadiopu Solo with Christian Hergoder Gallery. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of projects to do as well. In, in, and um, I think, yeah, I would say that that Lima Mopin show about well, three years ago, two and a half years ago, was the highlight because that's what led to everything else that has happened. Sort of the, the, the launch, the, the, the rapid launch and rise that you're, people have been seeing and saying, from where to where. I would say <laughs> actually actually started with that show. Yeah. Um, and yeah, sometimes you just need someone to believe in you. Yeah. Sometimes it's as simple as that, you know, or you just need to be at the right place at the right time with the right vision, with the right direction, with the right project. Or with Jesus. Or with, and with <laughs> Jesus, not or with, and with Jesus <laughs> along the way, guiding your footsteps. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, my last question is, so I will be doing this where I'll ask just a random question at the end of, all the podcasts and it's interesting that you said I keep asking you who are you um, because this last question has to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's in every moment we are either progressing towards our better self or regressing so my question is who are you becoming existentialist question um who am I becoming I think I'm in the post, I'm in the process of discovery, self-discovery. You know, meeting me on on that journey actually, um, because there's the facade of who I am as a gallery founder, and there's who I actually am. And I think what I've been doing of late is trying to unpack that and distinguish who those two people are, and if they intersect or if they're different people. I think they're part of the same person, um, and. I think that I told you the story of how I got into art, but I, I didn't tell you how I didn't know why I was in it. Mm. You know, I think that the story I told was a story of chance, a random series of events, you know, and it wasn't purposeful. So what I have been doing over the last one year is defining my purpose and my purpose, not just in business, but my but my purpose is a person. Why am I here? Who am I actually, right? As an individual, as a unique character, and as someone that is trying to do something and define and chart her own path for herself, but also in a wider ecosystem. And why am I doing it? And I think that I've, I've gotten I've gotten to a semblance of, of an understanding because for the first time I'm doing what I'm doing with meaning and purpose. I know why I'm, 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 I'm in art and why I'm projecting African culture and African voices and stories to the world. Not only because I think it's, it's imperative that we do so for a sense of self-healing as, as a race, as, as black people, because we, um, we're telling our stories and giving parts of our souls to the world. And we have a lot of unresolved trauma from historical events oh. and from colonialism and also from a sense of displacement and disorientation in terms of our identity. Mm -hmm. And I think that doing so on our own terms, using indigenous platforms, telling our own stories has a very important role to play in healing a lot of those, of those wounds. But also I think the reason I'm doing it is because of love, really, and um, and 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 I keep having to question what, where is the love in what I'm doing, and why am I trying to evoke love in in the people that are receiving what I'm doing, and am I trying to spread love to to the to the places that I'm going? Am I trying to 
impart love to the artists that I'm working with? Mm -hmm. Am I trying to to show the beauty of goodness and glory of love and really ultimately God in the context of my work? And why am I doing that? And I realize that the reason why I'm 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 in art is because that's my purpose. You know, I'm not doing it haphazardly and I'm not doing it randomly. I'm not doing it because of money. These things are coming along the way, but there's a greater purpose of meaning and self-love and loving the other and, and sharing that message through art that I've come to realize is what I should be doing and is the reason why I'm here. And it's also what I want my artists to, to be cognizant of as they're working. And having that realization makes it so much easier now. Yeah. Because before I was struggling, because it was it's hard, as you said, the art world is very hard to navigate. But if you have a clearly defined purpose for who you are and what you're doing and why you're doing it, then you have trust and faith that it's being guided and ordered and it'll be fine. So that's that's where I am now. That was amazing. <laughs> no, because a lot of people forget that we're all here for a reason, right? And we do spend a lot of time trying to figure out our purpose and figure out why or what, why we're doing certain things and what impact we're kind of having on others and I guess this world at large. So it's beautiful that you know what you're doing <laughs> and you know at least you can always have a reference point whenever things get very difficult and whenever, whenever you feel like <laughs> you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Um, so I, I like the fact that you that you have clarity. <laughs> so yes, that was my last question. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this has been great. It's been about almost an hour. <laughs> um, I hope that we can have this conversation again very soon. Yeah, me too. I love yeah. it. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>